<laughs> All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. Oh. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, think. the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought to you, you by MyCan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Hey, Chris, we know Michael Pollan, right? We love Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan, yes. One of his most famous lines, he says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I always wonder, like, food. Yeah. What does food mean there? I guess whole food, right? I think he means natural whole food, yeah. But also, what does that mean? I think he means in contrast from processed food. Yes, and ultra processed food too. I have trouble with these labels. Like what right. is processed food? What is ultra processed food? Right, they sound scary, but where's the definition? Yeah. What, how do you know what's what? Up until producing this episode, I thought that my go-to breakfast was a pretty healthy meal. So my go-to is- Yeah, what is it? Tell What's your go-to breakfast? Yeah, it's always the same. I have some frozen berries that I throw in and then I have yogurt and granola. Top it all off. Sounds perfect. Sounds amazing. It fills me up. It's a great meal or so I thought. Tasty, delicious. Yeah. Wait, You so you thought. Yeah. Our guest today would actually disagree that that is a healthy breakfast. In fact, if the granola has some sort of binding agent in it or they if, all the, do, right? if the yogurt has even natural flavoring added to it, they're both considered ultra processed foods. So yogurt is ultra processed yes. food. Yes. Yes. You're blowing my mind here. <laughs> it's making you rethink your breakfast decision. I probably just should have had coffee. I'm Jasmine Ratch. I'm Chris Shulgin. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. You hear that processed food is bad for you and that ultra processed food is even worse. But what does that mean? What does ultra processed food mean? And how can we change our diets to minimize our consumption of it? In today's episode, our Eat host, Leslie Beck, talks to Dr. Chris Van Tulliken. His new book called Ultra Processed People, Why We Can't Stop Eating Food That Isn't Food, is a number one international bestseller. He takes the reader through his own journey, learning about ultra processed food, what it really is, how you can spot it in a grocery store and how to try your best to avoid it when it seems to be everywhere. If you're anything like we are, this episode and this book is going to make you seriously rethink your understanding of what junk versus healthy food is. It's a really eye-opening conversation that I think is important for everybody to hear. Here's Leslie Beck. Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Beck, and I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Chris Van Tulliken to this episode of Eat, Move, Think. Uh, welcome, Chris. How are you? I'm extremely well. It's, it's great to be talking to you, Leslie. First of all, congratulations on your new book, Ultra Processed People, Why We Can't Stop Eating Food That Isn't Food. I read the book, a very compelling read, but at the same time, you know, considering that Canadians consume 50% of their calories from ultra processed foods, it's, it's distressing as well. And kids ages 9 to 13 consume even more. First, tell me about your career. How did you come to write this book? So I'm an infectious diseases doctor, and that might seem like a bit of an odd fit, but I worked for a long time in complex humanitarian emergencies. So I worked in Central African Republic, in Myanmar, and in Pakistan, uh, particularly for, for prolonged periods of time. And what I saw there was a lot of children and infants dying because of aggressive marketing by companies that make uh, infant food, particularly infant formula. The kind of stories that many people may remember from the 1970s led to widespread boycotts and that I thought had gone away. And so in my work as an infection doctor, many of the infections I was seeing were being caused by baby food being made up with, with filthy water, by people who couldn't fundamentally afford it and couldn't read the packaging to make it up appropriately. And so that led to it, my general research interest now, which is about what I call the commercial determinants of health. So about how big companies affect our health and in good ways and in bad ways. I've got to say mainly in bad ways. I primarily study the ways in which companies affect our health negatively. So I treat patients with tropical diseases and with infections, but my research is really all about how economics affects human health. And that's what led you to write this book. Yeah, I mean, there's a personal story as well. I have an identical twin brother and we we broadcast for the BBC together. Uh, so when we're, when we're not being academics or doctors, we do some, some broadcasting. He went and lived in the States to do a master's in public health. And while he was there, he put on a huge amount of weight, so, so much so actually that there was the biggest weight disparity between us more than any other pair of twins studied. So we're in a big research study. Wow. 
And so I've had someone who's very close to me, who's my genetic clone, living with significant obesity for a large part of my adult life. And I have found that very upsetting. And so this, the book was, is a lot about the personal experience of having an identical twin who's, who's living with obesity and about my kind of journey to try and help him. Okay. So let's first define ultra processed foods for our listeners. You say that over the past 150 years, food has become not food. How would you describe ultra processed foods? So ultra processed foods, it's a big category of food and there's a very long formal scientific definition. This isn't, um, this isn't a phrase like junk food. It's not a casual lay phrase. It's got a formal scientific definition that has to encompass a lot of different processes, but it boils down to this. If it's wrapped in plastic and it contains at least one ingredient that you don't typically find in a domestic kitchen, then it will be an ultra processed food. There's another good definition, which is any food with a health claim on the pack is likely to be ultra processed. If something says it's low fat or vitamin enriched or supports weight loss or benefits your immune system, those things are all likely to be ultra processed food. You know, I read some of the people you interviewed for the book, some of the ways they described ultra processed foods. And, you know, for example, Paul Hart, the food industry expert you spoke to said, ultra processed foods are reconstructed from whole food that has been reduced to its basic molecular constituents, which are then modified and reassembled into food-like shapes and textures, and then heavily salted, sweetened, colored, and flavored. Wow. You know, when you, when you hear it like that, you can't believe what you're eating. The logic of that is that it's terribly expensive to grow cobs of corn and then try and sell them to people. They spoil and people can only eat a corn on the cob so often. So if you're a corn manufacturer, what you want to do is grow your crop at enormous scale, feed it to animals, because that's a great way of getting rid of some of it. But then you want to disassemble the corn into flakes of protein, into high fructose corn syrup, into modified maize starches, into corn oil, which you can then treat in various different ways. And all of those different powders and basic carbohydrate, fat, and protein, all, all of which can be modified, they have nearly infinite shelf lives, and they can be added to almost any product under the sun for any age group or demographic anywhere in the world. So you add enormous value by ultra-processing your, your basic commodity crop. And that's the underpinning economic logic. And once you understand those sort of base ingredients, you'll see them on all your packaging, that whether it's your pizza or your energy bar or your breakfast cereal or your frozen lasagna, it is all basically made from rice, wheat, or corn, disassembled and then reassembled. And in your book, you wrote that there was one description of ultra-processed foods that made the deepest impression on you. And that was uh, from a Brazilian research you spoke with who said most ultra processed food is not food. It's an industrial produced edible substance. That was Fernanda Rauber. And as part of a pilot study, I went on an 80% ultra processed food diet to see what it would do to my body to generate data for a much bigger study that we're now doing with some colleagues at University College London. And I spoke to Fernanda about how to design this study. And every time I mentioned ultra processed food, she'd correct, oh, every time I mentioned food referring to UPF, she'd correct me and go, it's not food. It's not food. It's an industrially produced edible substance. And at the end of that phone call with her, I sat down to eat an ultra processed meal of takeaway fried chicken and, and some fries and dips. Yeah. And I couldn't eat it. And she had flicked some switch in my brain that meant I could no longer enjoy it. And that's sort of what the book is trying to offer the reader. And I don't know if you've experienced this, Leslie, but you probably didn't have a great ultra processed food intake in the first place, I'm guessing. That's right. But the idea is that someone who's reading uh, might have that same experience where by the end of the book, mm -hmm. they simply wouldn't want this food anymore. Yeah. And nutritionally speaking, too, we'll point out that uh, ultra processed foods tend to be high in added sugar, sodium, unhealthy fats, and low in fiber, micronutrients and, and phytochemicals that are stripped away during the ultra processing process. That's completely right. You mentioned some foods that are in this category of ultra processed foods. And, and you mentioned that it's not all just what people think of as junk foods, whether that's candy, pop, you know, sweet, salty snacks, that kind of thing, but many packaged foods that we think are good for us. So can you just share with us the range of foods we'll find 
in a grocery store or a natural food store that are ultra processed foods, foods that many of us may add to our grocery carts, not realizing they're ultra processed foods. So for me, the things that surprised me when after my diet, when I when I've tried to cut down on ultra processed food, the things that really surprised me that that I was still eating a lot of flavored yogurts for my kids almost all contain things like flavorings, whether they're natural flavoring, it's still a sign of ultra processing and modified maize starches. Um, they often contain gums like xanthan gum or guar gum or locust bean gum. Uh, most breakfast cereals are ultra processed. Most of them have emulsifiers binding things together. They have flavorings. They have high fructose corn syrup, dextrose, glucose, soy protein isolates, whey protein isolates. They have lots of different things in them that, that signify ultra processed. Uh, supermarket bread is almost entirely ultra processed. So that means that I'm guessing you have the same high end sandwich shops for the you know, for the busy lawyers and doctors and, and professional people who are happy to spend 10 bucks on a sandwich at lunch, those will almost always be ultra processed. The condiments in them and the bread will contain emulsifiers, maltodextrin and, and sugars like dextrose. So those those are the ways we're getting calories that we we would think of as being healthy. Often that stuff is sold to us as it's high fiber and and it's a very normal thing to eat. In. Whole grain. Right. And in Canada and the UK, we've been eating that stuff for, you know, three, four generations. I, I eat exactly the same cereals. My kids eat the same cereals for breakfast that I did and that my dad did. Let's come back to some of those cheaper alternatives and additives used to make ultra processed foods. Tell us a little bit about gums. I mean, we see them in so many foods. Exanthem gum is everywhere. What do these products, what do these ingredients, shall I say, do? And are they harmful? So one of the things to say about the additives is a lot of people, when they first encounter the concept of ultra processed food, get very worried about all the additives. Additive anxiety is warranted in certain specific instances, like with xanthan gum. But in general, the additives are just a sign that this is food that's been engineered to drive excess consumption. In terms of those gums, they're added for often quite benign reasons. So you'll find them in yogurts and ice cream because they replace fats. You'll find them in um, mayonnaises that are low fats and lot, lots of other low fat dressings. So instead of having a fat giving a slippery oiliness to, to whether it's an ice cream or a, or a salad dressing, if you put in these gums, xanthan gum is a bacterial exudate. And the way I think about it is if you clean the filter out of your dishwasher, if you get that filter out of the bottom and you get the slime off it, that's a bit like xanthan gum. It's a, a thing that bacteria secrete to stick to things and create biofilms. They, they cause infections. And xanthan gum gives that slippery, mucousy texture to things that, that can then make a low-fat claim. Locust bean gum, guar gum, those are from plants. They probably don't have very much effect on the human body. But there are two ways, two reasons I think we should worry about them. We know that xanthan gum feeds bacteria in the gut that wouldn't otherwise be there. So we can find bacteria in your gut and my gut, because we've almost certainly eaten xanthan gum in our lives, that you do not find in remote populations that never eat xanthan gum. And we know that those bacteria that feed on the xanthan gum secrete a substance that then is fed on by another completely novel bacteria. So the xanthan gum is setting up a food chain in the gut, and it does this in infants at a very young age. We don't understand if this is harmful, but we have every reason to think that fiddling around with the microbiomes of young children is probably a bad idea to, to take a punt on. Um, the other reason I think that we would be, I, I would be concerned about these gums is that what we know about ultra processed food is that it creates a set of lies. So it's it's telling lies to our mouth that our bodies then uh, misinterpret. So the gums create a fatty sensation in the mouth that may signal into the body that fat is on its way. In the same way that artificial sweeteners signal that sugar is on its way. And the flavor enhancers signal that protein is on its way. And when the sugar or the fat or the protein doesn't arrive, we think that may be one of the reasons that they drive excess consumption. So I think in general, creating synthetic sensations in the mouth for nutrition that never arrives. We have some early evidence, particularly with artificial sweeteners, that that's probably not a good thing to do. 
you know, sweet, sweet taste isn't just fun. Sweet taste is there to say, hey, sugar's on your way. Release insulin. Prepare yourself physiologically. I mean, you, you know all this um, probably better than me. And so this, is, this may be one of the reasons the World Health Organization published a big piece of research saying that artificial sweeteners are not associated with weight loss and may predispose to diabetes. And so anything that tells a lie in our mouth may be harmful for the same reason. And what about modified starches? We see them everywhere on, on these foods. So we've been fiddling around with starches for a really long time, since the early 19th century. And we know that some of them in mouse experiments do seem to predispose toward inflammation. And we don't really understand why that is. Now, some starches are probably extremely benign. And in fact, in your gut, between the acid and the enzymes, you do chemically modify starches when you eat them. So people needn't necessarily panic about modified starch. But there are indications that some of the synthetic starches do cause this gut inflammation. It may be that they're causing um, a dysbiosis in the microbiome. It may be that they're directly impacting gut mucus or, or, or inflaming things in other ways. But things like carboxymethylcellulose, we know that they are disrupting the gut. And we're seeing an epidemic of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We're seeing. If I talk to my colleagues who are pediatric gastroenterologists, you know they they are really puzzled by the increases in children with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and other other bowel disturbances. Um, that it may be the modified starches. It may also be the emulsifiers. So some of the evidence on the emulsification agents, whether it's whether it's polysorbate eighty, carboxymethylcellulose, all these molecules, some of which occur naturally may be harmless. It may be the dose we're eating them. It may be that we're eating them at, at, um, in in formulations that are very unnatural. But the data from rodents is very compelling. Now, mice aren't people. And so we can never use mice to say that something's completely safe. But when it comes to a risk assessment and saying, should we be precautionary about adding all this stuff to our food? I think it's reasonable to look at the mouse data and go, this is compelling and it's worrying. And it's also best seen in the epidemiological context where ultra processed food containing emulsifiers is strongly associated with things like inflammatory bowel disease. So I, I think there are good reasons to worry about a lot of these additives. And we haven't studied them in a human context adequately. So let's let's move there now. Let's let's move on to what the research is showing about the health consequences of a steady intake of ultra processed foods. What do we know about eating ultra processed foods on a regular basis and the risk of chronic diseases like obesity, cardiovascular disease and others? So we don't just have one or two studies that show that ultra processed food is associated with weight gain. We have a lot of studies. What we have is multiple prospective epidemiological studies. These are studies looking forward in time where they're not randomized controlled trials, but they are a pretty good layer of evidence. So this is the kind of studies that linked uh, smoking with lung cancer. And th these studies show that ultra processed food is associated with weight gain and obesity, but also depression, anxiety, inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, dementia, um, all cause mortality from cancers, but also some specific cancers like uh, bowel cancer and breast cancer, metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes, and early death from all causes. And so in 2019, there was a Lancet paper published, which didn't get as much attention as it should have. It did make a few headlines, and it showed that poor diet, i.e. an ultra-processed diet, is now the leading cause of death for people on planet Earth. And so we've now seen our diet overtake smoking. And that's why for a long time, the food industry has been able to say, look, don't be ridiculous. Comparing food to tobacco is offensive. It's stigmatizing. It's ridiculous. The tobacco industry is completely different to the food industry. We are now at a point where it is completely legitimate to compare the companies that make our food with the companies that make our cigarettes. So let's talk a little bit about obesity, because that's where most of the research, I think, has been done in so far. Yeah. What is it about ultra processed foods that that increases the risk of obesity? Um, is it because they're high in salt, added sugar, fats, or is it about the ultra processing itself? 
So a lot of the epidemiological studies, the population data, made adjustments. They, they did controls to ask this question, is ultra-processed food just fatty, salty, sugary, low-fiber food? And when they adjusted for all those macronutrients and salt, they found that the effects remain statistically significant, but they also remain the same in magnitude. So it really does look like the ultra-processing, i.e. the physical, thermal, chemical things done to food, the additives, the marketing, all those aspects are driving weight gain, in fact, much more significantly than the fat, the salt, and the sugar. And the way I would think about this is that if you make a homemade cake or a homemade lasagna, it is possible, of course, to gain weight using traditional food. That's been you know, observed throughout history, going back to prehistory, there has been obesity in human populations. But it's existed at barely an integer percentage level. So a, a tiny percentage, one, two percent of people. Now we see that 60 percent of us, myself included, live with overweight or obesity. And that is entirely due to ultra processed food. So we've long been able to make delicious homemade fatty food. You can cook a lasagna, bake cookies, bake a cake, and it's never led to significant levels of obesity. Now, I do want to put in a little caveat there and say, I do think the fat, salt, sugar content of food is important. We don't need to throw away all of our nutritional guidance up to this point. If you're cooking at home and pouring cream and butter all over everything, you know, you, you do want to be somewhat aware of that. This isn't a carte blanche to add salt to whatever you right. want. But um, what is clear from the data is that the ultra processing does make a difference. And how? How does it? So the mechanisms, two of the big ones are the food is soft, and it's very energy dense. So the softness, um, if you eat something like a burger from a popular chain or a breakfast cereal or a chewy bar, there are illusions of texture. It may feel like it's got some crunch or some crisp, but basically this food barely needs to be chewed at all. So you can swallow a far higher rate of calories than your body is able to keep up with. And those evolved systems inside us that release hormones that say, okay, you're done, stop eating now, they can't keep up with the rate of calorie intake. It's energy dense because it's dry. It's dry for shelf life. So things like those burgers, uh, fried chicken, pizzas, uh, you know, ready meals, confectionery, it all feels maybe moist and sticky and wet, but there's almost no water content. And that, again, drives up that energy density. So those are two of the big mechanisms. There are then these inflammatory effects, uh, effects on hormones, effects on the microbiome, all of which we think drive excess consumption, the flavor enhancers. For me, the big thing that we mustn't lose sight of is that this is food that is engineered with a very specific purpose. It's about financialized growth. So it's not just about making money, about making profit. It's about generating equity value so that there's a very small number of companies that make our food in Canada and the United Kingdom. Your food is made by exactly the same companies that make my food. There are about 10 to 15 of them. And these are companies owned by very large asset management funds. They're, they're owned by Vanguard, BlackRock, Jupiter, your pensions, government pension schemes. Um, and they're legally obliged to deliver growth to those owners. And so the question I want listeners really to be asking is, it's easy to get bogged down in agonizing over a particular label or a particular product. The question I think that's really important is, was this food made by someone who cares about me, who wants to nourish me? Or was this food made for um, financialized profit and, and growth? And if the answer is the latter, then it will probably have been engineered to get you to eat more of it. And I spoke to loads of people in the food industry who all described this process of focus group testing, where you know there's breakfast cereal box A and a slightly different formula box B. And if the focus group eats more of box B, that's the one that goes on the shelves. And that happens every year, year in, year out. It's been happening for many, many decades to the point where these breakfast cereals breads or sweets or pizzas are really, really hard to stop eating. And I think listeners will recognize themselves. So about 50 to 60% of people listening will recognize that there are foods they struggle with. And I certainly recognize that. And if they figure out what those foods are, almost always those foods will be ultra processed. Okay. So they're soft Less mm -hmm. chewing is required. You can eat them more quickly, consume more calories. They're dry to promote a, a longer shelf life. So that means they're more calorie dense. And you alluded to earlier, too, that the added flavors, whether they're artificial or natural and other additives as well, there seems to be some mismatch between 
taste and mouthfeel and the nutrients that are in our gut. And that can increase consumption as well. Absolutely. There's a, there's a great Canadian journalist actually called Mark Schatzka who wrote a book called The Dorito Effect, a really important book. Yeah, we had him on this podcast, actually. I've spoke to him. Oh, did you? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. He was great. I've never spoken to Mark, but his, his book had a big influence over my book. And we could explain almost all of the observed phenomena using just the emulsifier problem or just flavoring or just flavor enhancers or just the softness, just the energy density, just the texture of the food. And we could explain almost all of it using the marketing. And what we see with any one of these products is we're putting together six, seven, eight, nine, ten mechanisms by which they drive you to eat more. And there are many, many more that we we don't know about. You know, the, the food industry are immensely clever and they're engineering things in a very sophisticated way. Very scary. So ultra processed foods are ubiquitous. They're, they're everywhere in our food environment. So what can we do? What needs to happen in your opinion? One of the things I try and do in my book is avoid giving anyone any advice. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, I, I speak from a position of immense privilege. You know, I'm through sheer naked, blind, good luck. I was born into the family I was born in, and I've been lucky to be educated, and I have a job where I have enough time and money to eat well. For many, many people in Canada and in the UK, ultra processed food is the only food they can afford. It's the only food that is available to them. And they're told constantly that it's healthy and it's what they've been brought, brought up to cook. So the solutions for many individuals are really, really hard. And some people listening will be able to recognize that they have an addiction and may be able to quit, uh, may be able to, to listen to this podcast or read the book and may find they're disgusted and they may be able to, to just cut it out of their diet. Some people will have the resources to just cut down. Some people are going to feel really, really angry and frustrated and like they are the victim of predatory marketing by predatory corporations. And to those people, I would just say you have my, my love and sympathy and you have to turn your rage into activism. And there is going to need to be a lot of anger and frustration to change this food system. I think part of the reason that in the United Kingdom, at least, the book is resonating with people is because people have started to realize they're being gaslit by the government that is failing to regulate the food companies and by the food companies themselves. And that the reason they struggle with food is not because they're weak-willed, it's not because they're stupid, it's because they are being marketed aggressively addictive products from cradle to grave. So I don't have individual solutions for a lot of people. There isn't much that some people can do. However, there are resources out there that do explain how to cook from scratch in cheap ways, but it's gonna it's gonna be a hassle. Um, especially if you've got young kids. So for individuals who are in that situation, the other thing I'd say is my kids still eat ultra processed food. You know, they they go to kids' parties and I don't ban this. About twice a week, they have a meal of fish fingers, oven chips, baked beans, you know, lousy bread. You know, this, this is okay. We, we, we mustn't panic. But governments basically need to act and act really fast. It needs to go in the Canadian National Nutrition Guidance. There is, you are more progressive than us. You would at least do mentioning mention processing in your national guidance. Uh, we don't in the UK. We do, yeah. So uh, Canada's ahead on this. Um, you're going to need to regulate the marketing of these foods. That, that for me is the big step. There should not be cartoon characters on packets of chocolate biscuits sold as breakfast cereal. Canada's alive to this and your food system is somewhat less controlled by the giant food corporations than ours is in the UK. But the big cultural shift is that doctors, policymakers, scientists need to start refusing the money from the food companies. Not because food companies are evil, but because they have to behave like all companies. They have to make profit. And so they are muddying the science and they're doing it very effectively. And until doctors start refusing the money, I feel like nothing much is going to change. So let me ask you a question. Um, after researching and writing this book, have you made changes to your own diet, Chris? I remember, I think at the beginning of the book, you said you figured your own diet was made up of about about 30% of your calories came from ultra processed foods. So the gift that Fernanda Rauber gave me really is that I really don't want it and I don't like it anymore. So I don't eat any of it. There is a situation where I will. And it's the situation where I find myself at a kid's birthday party with my, you know, the, the other parents who are friends of mine. And there's ultra processed 
stuff all over the table. And if I don't eat it, everyone else feels that I am judging them because they've all, you know, read the of book. Of course, yes. And they think that I'm being a snob. So I, I will go to the kids' parties and I will eat the orange triangles of crisp and I will eat a slice of cake just so I'm not a weirdo. And I don't want my kids to, to be weirdos either. So it's very complex to navigate this space without appearing to be a snob. And that's a reflection of how violent our food system is really, that simply trying to eat normal food is really complicated. And in the UK particularly, it's a it's a class issue. And industry are really skillful at exploiting that. And so I'm I'm working very hard to not be painted as someone who is lecturing low income families on how they should eat, you know. But yeah, I, I, I really try and not eat it anymore. Well, thank you for sharing that. Chris, you did your own personal experiment of eating ultra processed foods while you were doing the research for this book. Tell us about what you did and how you felt. What was your experience? So this wasn't just a stunt I did because I was writing a book. I did this in, in partnership with colleagues in the obesity department at University College London where I work. And I ate this ultra processed diet. 80% of my calories came, came from UPF for a month. And that's a, that's not an extreme diet. So I wasn't force feeding myself. That is a normal diet for a Canadian teenager. That's what most of them eat, or that's what many of them eat. It's fairly typical. Three things happened. I gained so much weight that if I'd continued for a year, I would have doubled my body weight and I was not force feeding myself. The second thing that happened was that we did a test meal at the end of the diet where we measured my hormone response to a meal. At the end of when you eat a big meal, you, you have hunger hormones and satiety hormones and they, they should flip around. At the end of my diet, my hunger hormones remain sky high at the end of a big meal. So this is food that is interfering with our body's evolved mechanisms that tell us when to stop. And the third thing was we did a brain scan. And I thought this brain scan would be a complete waste of time. You know, I'm I'm 44 years old. We're not going to affect my brain wiring with a month of eating food that's completely legal. In fact, we saw hugely significant increases in connectivity between the parts at the back of your brain that deal with habit and automatic behaviors and the parts deep in the middle of your brain that deal with addiction and reward. And those were not artifacts. They were very robust changes. We did this with some very experienced uh, MRI physicists and, and clinical neurologists. So that really was the most disturbing finding, because if it's doing that to the brain of a 44-year-old, what is it doing to the developing brain of a child who's eating ultra-processed food from, from essentially from birth to the age of 10 to 20? Well, right. I mean, that was a four-week study you did. That's remarkable. Yeah. I mean, it, every, everyone was very surprised. So much so we went and repeated the MRI uh, and found that the the effect, you know, that the changes remained six weeks later after, after I'd stopped the diet as well. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Chris. It's been a fascinating conversation. And, and you know, once again, just congratulations on this book. A very important read, I, I would absolutely have to say. It means so much hearing that from you of all people. It, it, it really does. So I, I really appreciate being on this. And um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you again, and I'll let you get back to your day and uh, keep up the amazing work. Thanks so much. and speak soon. Cheers. That was Leslie Beck, our Eat host and MedCan's Director of Food and Nutrition, in conversation with Dr. Chris Van Tulken, author of Ultra Processed People and Infectious Diseases Doctor and Researcher at the University College in London, England. You can follow Dr. Van Tulken on Twitter at Dr. Chris VT. That's D O C T O R C H R I S V T. Follow Leslie Beck on Twitter at Leslie Beck R D. To book a consultation with a MedCan dietitian, email nutrition at medcan.com. We'll post episode highlights and other links that you can visit on our website, eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat, Move, Think is produced by Ghost Bureau, Jasmine Ratch is managing producer, social media and strategy support is from Chantal Gertan, Andrew Imex, and Emily Bozik. And executive producer is Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness.
This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.